Welcome to Mistaken Identity. Today, I'll interview Marla Hay, Vice President of Security, Privacy, and Data Management at Salesforce. We'll talk about how at Salesforce, Marla helps customers keep their data secure and private. Tune in to hear Marla describe how to treat customer data carefully and how to build great digital experiences through experimentation and an understanding of the customer. She also dives into her experience with user testing to build great products and improve existing ones. This podcast is brought to you by Okta. Innovate at scale while keeping your business and customers safe. Ready to see for yourself? Go to okta.com slash customer ID for more. Hi everyone, welcome to today's episode of Mistaken Identity. Today, I'm really excited to have Marla Hay, who's Vice President of Product Management at Salesforce. Marla, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, Matt. Really excited to have you today. I think it's going to be an awesome conversation around, you know, how we look at building amazing customer experiences and products that customers love. But before we get into that, maybe give the folks, the listeners, a little insight into what you do at Salesforce, what keeps you busy in your role as, as vice president of product. So yeah, I've been at Salesforce for about six years. Um, in my current role as Vice President of Security, Privacy, Data Management at Salesforce, uh, look after an area where we provide security, privacy, and data management products to, um, to our customers. And so um, our goal really is to help our customers become uh, customer companies. Uh, and my part of that is helping make it really easy for them to keep their customer data safe secure, private, um, and generally kind of give them an easy button for, uh, for the work that they're, the, the great work they're already doing. And I know you have a lot of really great experience in what's called SIAM or customer identity and access management. Maybe just give uh, the folks a little background on SIAM, you know, your experience with SIAM. And I know you've talked about privacy and obviously security as well, but just, you know, elements of your experience from SIAM in general. Before Salesforce actually, uh, looked after product at a SIAM company and, it, uh, it was a really incredible experience. Consumer identity, consumer privacy is so important and fundamental to really the future of where we're going with technology, um, innovation, and being able to really provide an experience that is useful to consumers um, requires that they have inherent trust in uh, in their ability to give data to, to you as a company. Uh, and so it was really exciting to be kind of in this space where we're looking at how do we help our, how do we help companies provide uh, a safe, secure place for customer data and the ability to make connections about what their customers really care about in order to create this incredible customer experience that allows their customers to say, Hey, these, uh, this is, this is an awesome company and I want to continue to invest my time, my, my data, my energy in this organization. Um, and I feel comfortable doing it because I know that they're, they are good stewards of my data. And so that was a, I, I feel like a really exciting place to be. And it still is, uh, for in, uh, in Siam and, and in uh, consumer identity in general. This is really a challenge for a lot of businesses is trying to balance that, you know, the, the delivery of the customer experience along with security and privacy at the same time. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how customer identity can be implemented to maybe, you know, address that balance of security and privacy and convenience at the same time? You're really hitting it like the intersection of the, the spaces that I kind of love the most is like, how do we make how do we make things so easy that, uh, how do we make privacy and security so easy that no one even knows that they're doing it? For the Siam space, it is super critical to really look at how do you make it really easy for consumers to do things like not have to have bad password hygiene, for example. Like, why do we even still have passwords? Just give everybody magic. <laughs> no kidding. Basically, a customer, a consumer, anyone who has to go through a thing that in, that engage that is privacy related, is going to shortcut it as much as they possibly can because we're all overloaded, we're all overwhelmed. They're not trying to do security and privacy; they're trying to do the thing they're trying to do, and security is getting in the way of that. So, anything that makes that easier for them in, enhances that experience, but also ensures that they're staying that they're staying private. So, things like. Um, multi-factor authentication, but with a, it's where you could just like looking at a device or like, ma or like magic links where you're like getting a 
code or a one-time thing where you're like not creating a password that's really like the same password you have 80,000 other places and probably in tens of thousands of breaches uh, is, is going to help make it easier for someone to authenticate and then get an experience that is really tied to who they are and what they care about. And, but in a way that, um, that makes it super easy for them to keep themselves secure and for an organization to keep their data secure. When it's working well, nobody's thinking about it. Right. And right. I almost, I almost think about it as like an invisible hand, right? It's, it's, it, it is that invisible hand when it's working, you're not thinking about it at all, but oh man, when it breaks or where, the, where there's friction in the process, right. You right. really notice it. Uh, I think maybe, you know, going to your favorite coffee shop and having an experience where you have, you've had to reset your password while you're standing, trying to order your coffee at the barista and you've got angry customers lining up behind you and you're just trying <laughs> to pay for your coffee. Um, you know, that obviously hits a little home for me. That's an experience that I've had in the past, but that's the balance I think that we're trying to strike uh, between delivering an amazing customer experience at the same time as balancing, keeping folks secure and keeping their, their data private at the same time. Um, wondering if you have thoughts on how identity could be implemented from the perspective of driving other business metrics or business outcomes like improving adoption or even driving that customer engagement or even retention of products really at the end of the day. The key is like the more you understand your customers, your consumers, um, your, your users, your employees, like the more you can understand who these people are and what's important to them and what they care about, the better you can make their experiences. An authenticated experience is really the best way to do it. And you can't, you, it, I would also say like in, in um, kind of in my experience, it's important to do that at the right point too. For example, like retail, I know like from, from being behind the scenes on it, like gets checkout, it's like so hard to deal with, but um, but like you have to have it because it will, cause you can stop people if you put an authenticated experience in front of it too early. But what you can do is create, make it really easy for them to have an authenticated experience by, by the end time they get to the end of it. Hey, you're, all you have to do is click yes to basically have an account and then we will help you remember it. You don't have to, it's not going to be a big hassle every time you come back. But well, it'll be really easy for you now to do things like track where your stuff is and order more things and for us to know who you are and then like make great product recommendations and things like that where the user, the consumer is really getting significant benefit out of it. And it, you're just kind of stepping them along um, sort of like a relationship, like you're cr creating this deeper and deeper relationship with them and giving them uh, and then they're giving you sort of like more and more of their time and information and access like as as your uh as that relationship sort of like grows in mutual value it's a really important part of um of increasing all of all of those uh kpis that that all companies have is authentication is a really critical part of that and then uh, and doing it in the right way where you're creating like an engaged relationship with a, with a consumer over time, knowing who that person is, that authentication piece of it is a critical component to keeping them engaged and to doing the right thing for them and to not making it difficult uh, for them to continue the relationship with you. Yeah, I feel like a theme that you're hitting on there is all around the customer experience, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. about really delivering that customer experience. And for me, there was something that I read recently that really resonated with me for companies in that the customer experience is the new competitive battleground. Right. Like it is it is how successful companies are going to be successful. They need to think about how they build those journeys, those experiences, those amazing you know, customer products and experiences together to drive those uh, those customer experiences. But, you know, would love your thoughts on even from a product management perspective where the folks that are listening that are actually building these applications and these experiences. What are some strategies or what are some things that product managers or product folks could, should be thinking about in order to leverage customer identity and that knowledge to provide a better customer experience for their end users. The customer experience really is kind of the new battleground because there are things that just like do not fly now that flew when, when Siam was far more nascent that you could get away with. I remember like very early days, like you would use a identity provider 
and um, the app was just going to ask for every single piece of information about you possible just to get, just to like, sometimes just to even get into the website. This is like mm -hmm. 10 plus years ago. This is a long time ago. <laughs> and like in tech years, <laughs> that was a long time ago in tech years. Yeah. Uh, and that was obviously a terrible idea, even at that time. And we'd always dis you know, you would dissuade anyone from doing that just from like a common sense perspective. But, um, but it wasn't like totally anathema, uh, in the, in the tech world or in the app world or in the, or in the retail world to do something like that. And now it would, it would just be ridiculous. Like that would never fly you, everything is done, um, with the lowest friction possible. If somebody encountered, a, uh, uh, experiences with even like a modicum of friction, there are people who are doing, now we see what it looks like to do it. Well, there are enough people who are doing it. Well, consumers are like, well, I don't have to put up with this. They know what they can demand and rightly so. Like, um, it is, uh, it is absolutely paramount that, that we have, incredibly seamless and transparent and invisible hand type experiences for, uh, for consumers to just, I mean, and that's really like the standard. It's not even like, it's not even the gold standard anymore. It's like, it's just, that's the baseline. Like you need to get, you need to have a good positive experience with, uh, for, to, in order to, to, to expect to have any, to retain any consumers, let alone gain uh, loyalty and build up those KPIs. You're right. It's really the expectation now, right? I think about how my kids interact with technology, right? Touch screens. It seems simple, but it's just, that's the expectation that everything that has a screen, you should be able to touch. And I constantly have to clean my, my television screen because it's not a touch screen. And, but the, you know, it just goes to show you that, you know, a similar type of experience to my kids, you know, assuming that that touch experience exists everywhere is becoming how folks are really expecting how they log in or sign up, uh, you know, and then interact really with a digital app application, right? So I think there's a couple things that you hit on earlier around how folks can like some things that they can think about to improve security, like multi-factor authentication and SSO and biometrics, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What about from a customer experience perspective, what are some ways uh, that companies could improve that customer experience or the way that customers interact with their digital applications? Put simply, it make them make people remember as little as possible. There is no more disappointing feeling than showing up on a screen and then all of a sudden then the next step, there's a login screen and you're like, uh oh, I don't remember this. Like, who am I on here? What is my username? Is it my is it my email? Do they have my phone number? Like what? It, so like as much as possible, making it so you are using information that is super easily accessible to that person. And so if you can, that that's like devices. Like if you can, if you can send somebody a code or you can send somebody a link or you can, um, or you can give them information that will help them prove their identity or validate who they are, use those biometrics, use the location, use the, use the device that they're, that they're coming from, um, to help you really kind of triangulate Hey, we got a pretty good idea of who this person is and then do the, and then do what you need to, to validate that. Don't give them absolutely nothing. And then tell them you, you figure it out. Good luck getting in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Um, you know, I, I, one thing that I'm really excited for is passkey technology. I think some of the things that even Google has announced recently and, and opening up passkey technology across all now commercial and even workplace, uh, you know, properties is pretty awesome that I know the day that it came out, I enabled it across all my Google properties and just that ability to not have to remember a password to very easily sign on to all of my Google properties. And not even that, anything that I've created an account or has an account linked with a Google property, I can easily sign into now. I don't have to remember a password. Yeah, like, I, I think like we're, we're very much on, if not the dawn, we're even past it. It might even be noon or midday around us never ever needing passwords again, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I feel like for everybody who's been in the identity industry, especially from like sort of the uh, earlier days, it's like we've all, everybody's been be beating the same drum of like, we've got to get rid of passwords. And it feels like it's finally happening. And it really does take, like it does take like a Google, an Apple, like it takes these big, big, big um, identity providers with those types of capabilities to be able to do something like that and to make it like ubiquitous so that you're really able to see, um, 
you're really able to kind of go anywhere and you've got there's some hint of one of those um, elements somewhere that you can so that you can use pass keys uh, really across the board. I think that's it's such an exciting that's a it's a very exciting time for um, for authentication and it's it's a it's a good reason to uh, to to then also make sure we're offloading things like those authentication capabilities to to companies that are like do that that's what they do um, or like that's a big part of what what they're working on so I think that's it's exciting to see that yeah absolutely I think you're you're kind of hitting on one thing that I like to think about as well as this concept of like should I build it or should I you know should I buy it and I think for a lot of companies especially if you're just starting out in your journey of your application and you have a development team, it might it might feel like it's super easy or that because you have developers and builders that you can build these things yourself from a SaaS perspective. Yeah. Um, and I think like every company is trying to balance that, right? They're trying to balance that whether they do that. Do they spend development time and resources building and maintaining systems that aren't part of their core business? Or do they go to a best in breed solution? What, I would love your thoughts and, ex, and just your experience on sort of this concept of build versus buy when it comes to systems and technology. It's funny, like I'll, I guess I'll, uh, I'll tell you this story that's like totally not related to identity at all. But when I was <laughs> like, awesome. so I was a, um, when I was an intern, I was working on this, uh, like this, an application that took a credit card. And I was like, oh, I need to make sure that we're encrypting this. This is like a long, long time. I'm not even going to say how long ago, a really long time ago. And I, I didn't, I was just like, well, I'll just, I can write an encryption algorithm. I'll just do that. And so I spent like a few weeks writing this awful encryption algorithm. It was like, um, incredibly breakable. Uh, but it was an encryption algorithm at the end of the couple of weeks. I was like, man, I just wasted a whole lot of time doing something badly that, uh, that would have been really easy for me to just go get somewhere else. But it, I, you know, I was also an intern. It was a fun experience, but so that's sort of like, that's what I feel like happens sometimes with like the build by it's like, well, this is, we can build it. Um, but the litmus, litmus test should really be like, does this exist? And is someone else already doing it well? Um, and do I need to do it to a standard or do I have some kind of like, or is it something that it's super free form? And if the answer to the, both of those questions is like, yes, people are, so yes, someone's already doing it. And yes, there's like a standard that goes with it. Then like, you should never build, why would you ever build that? Like, that's what, that's why th that's an, that is exactly why those things exist. Like people do get, make, the, make it very easy to just consume those things. And then they worry about all those teeny tiny little details and keep iterating on it and, um, and keep on top of all of the elements of it. So that's like things like identity standards are one of those mm. things where it's like, yeah, you, you could, but why, like, why would you, it's like, it's been done and it's been done really well, um, already. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Spend your time. That's such a great point. That, that's what, that was going to be what, my next question as well is what are some of the benefits that you see in, in procuring like a, a purpose-built solution versus trying to build it yourself internally? Right. You know, yeah, spend, I mean, your, spend your time elsewhere is a exactly. really good one. Yeah. Like nobody's ever said, oh, my gosh, I have too many engineers. Like <laughs> that's never happened. I have too much time for these projects. Like do the thing, do the things that everybody should be working on the things that like only they can do and only uh, that can only be done for their company or like putting together all of the things that that need to be put together. But um, yeah, spending time, you're you 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 need you, you need to find places for more time. I know everybody does, especially, um, especially sort of in this, in this like time in the industry where i uh, pretty much every company is doing more with fewer people right yeah. now. Um, there, everyone is short on time. So save yourself some headache and give yourself a little bit more room on your roadmap for something that's that you, that you really want to, that's exciting to get done. Yeah, and you mentioned roadmap. I'd love to get your thoughts on something I was thinking about too as you're as you're talking. And this is more around how you can integrate customer identity into your roadmap. But what are some best practices, or maybe even from your experiences that you've you've seen in incorporating customer identity and those customer insights into your product roadmap and within your development cycle? Have you had experience with that? Yeah, I mean, there is always a point where you're like, well, when at what point do we need does this do we need to support authentication? Like there's going to be it depending on I mean, depending on what you are servicing. But if you're working with 
people, if you're working with consumers, especially there's going to be that point. Uh, we've recently released some capabilities around preference management and, um, and integrating with, uh, authentication is obviously going to be a huge part of that. And so, Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't have to start that way. Like a lot of it's like, Hey, we're starting with like, we just uh, like the very first use case was like, Hey, I just need to be able to unsubscribe, but I want to keep it super narrow Mm -hmm. to, to make it like tight to the subscription and like, all right, well you can do maybe some some behind the scenes authorization, you still need, you'll still need authorization um, and authentication, but it's it maybe is more like a server side token based, like behind the scenes, we're doing like a one-time token thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, you, pretty quickly you're coming, you will come on the need to, to deal with um, authenticated, uh, authenticated users. And then it's, um, that is gonna open the door to really enabling a totally different customer experience. Yeah, I definitely agree. I was thinking about something too, from like a product management perspective, and maybe this is uh, so this, this would be, I think really interesting for any of the product or, or application builders on, on uh, who are listening to the episode right now too. But, and I love asking this question of like, how can you be sure that you're building the right thing? Like, how do you know if what you're building is the right thing? Yeah. Oh man. Like, you have to just test it with people like, oh, there's no shortcut really. Right. You have to test it with people. We did. So like early, early, early in my career, I would go to user our user conferences and like set up a little lab and basically sit people down in it and be like, and I'm going to give you a thing that you would commonly need to do, or you can give me a thing you would commonly need to do in this application. And I want you to do it. And they would do it and it would just be so eye opening. You're hmm. like, oh my God, like, why are you clicking over there? Why are you looking over the, <laughs> at this thing? Like, it's right here. Um, and then, and it's never, they're never wrong. Like you are wrong. Like you are wrong. If they're, if that, if they get frustrated, you are doing it wrong. Um, and w- I remember one in one case we had, we did this whole application and our expectation was like, we had this front end to it that had all of this information and we thought this is going to, this is like the key information. Everybody's going to use it. And over and over again, people are just like pushing the screen, like um, shrinking it, like (laughs) in it, just shrinking it to the side and never opening it again. Cause it's, it turns out that just real, even though people needed that information and we heard that people needed that information, they actually, they were like, they, for the most part, only wanted it in a particular context, and mm. were really just trying to get to the thing they were trying to do. And we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have gotten that just through like interviews and talking. We needed to like set something up and put it in front of them, and have them try it. So there's just there's no substitute for getting a thing out the door so that people can put their hands on it and then tell you how wrong you were about how you interpreted what they told you. <laughs> Ex- experimenting. I love it. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> pragmatic marketing has this uh, has this tenet that I, that I just love and it's your opinion although interesting is irrelevant, right? And and I think like <laughs> yeah. it, when it comes to product management I feel like that's that's a lot of what happens is that as product managers you'll get folks coming to you, sales folks, anyone else from the business saying you know, we need this because this. And as product folks, we're, we're kind of looking at them going, okay, show me, show me the, the number of customers that actually, you know, have asked for this. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and a lot of times that empirical evidence is hard to find. So I feel like that's one that's always stuck with me too, is, is your opinion, although interesting is irrelevant Re- to your point, it's really around experimentation and getting in front of the users and understanding how they're going to use it. Cause those are the ones that, that we need to care about. It's they're going to be using, you know, our product or application. We need to understand how, uh, how it benefits them. Even if you're talking to uh, to a user and you're interpreting it and you're like, okay, I've got, so users are asking for X, like there's also such an important aspect of really sitting down and getting deeper into like, what are they like, show me what you're doing here. Like, show me what you're working on and, and why you're asking for this thing. Um, we had a one, uh, one product we were working on where the, the users themselves were asking for like particular functionality. Mm. And when we sat down and walked through with them, and watch them like what like watch them do their jobs and watch what they were what they were doing it, it was sort of like a aha moment of like <laughs> oh you're not you're asking for this but actually like you are you're doing you are doing so much horrible work over here in this <laughs> other screen to get to this thing and you're asking for us to make this this much easier for you but oh my gosh we can eliminate 
the, all the awfulness over here too that you didn't even know to complain about because you're used to <laughs> just living in this garbage world where you have to do like 8,000 steps and and you're only asking us to make this a tiny bit easier. So that's that's really helpful too. Like really watch, really seeing the customer. I know it's not always possible and that's not always easy to do, but it, there there's nothing like actually sitting with a customer and watching them use your stuff. Oh, I, I just love that. I think that's such a great lesson. Everyone who's listening, make sure you, you take uh, take note of that, write that down, go put it into practice right now, take your products, get them in front of your customers, go sit with them too. Um, I, I just love that. I think there's no, there's no substitute for real market imperial customer, empirical customer evidence, right? I think uh, I used to do this a long, long time ago when I worked for a telco is I would, I would go and sit in a shopping mall and just see how people interacted with their, with their phones. Right. Like, how would they use it? What were they doing with it? And get a better understanding of exactly how we needed to better craft our messaging or develop, you know, other products or solutions that would make more sense to them based on how they were actually using the product. I just I think that's such a great lesson for everyone. That's so cool. That's really cool. A lot of fun. But thinking about even just the product, you know, development journey. Uh, maybe for some folks that are that are listening to this episode that are looking to get into product delivery or product management, what are some of the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows of creating a product? Like what's great about that process and what do you think is still being improved or what do you think needs to be improved about the product management or product delivery process? So the highs are really easy. It basically like having their man, having somebody say, oh man, you just, this like, this is exactly what I needed or like you just saved me a bucket of time. Like this is going to change things for me. Like mm -hmm. hearing that, like making somebody's world better, uh, in that way is so, is so cool. It's like just so gratifying and so rewarding. Um, the lows are probably like, there's two that sort of come to mind. One is like, um, one is realizing you don't nearly have, which is happens to everyone. So mm -hmm. this is just universal realizing you don't have the, the time or the resources to do the thing that you thought you had the time or resources to do, where you're like, this is, this is going to be this big of a thing. And everyone's like, yeah, it looks like it. And then it turned and then you get into it and it's like, oh, but actually there's this other thing over here that touches that, or like this thing actually turns out to be really complicated. And then it, turns into this like huge thing and it starts to feel like, Oh mm -hmm. man, <sighs> now what do we do? Do we cut bait and rot and like not do it? Do we just keep going and try to get, make it work? Like, um, those are really, those are like really the low points where you're realizing like we've invested a bunch of time in something and we maybe shouldn't keep investing time in it because it's not turning out to be the, to be or work the way we thought it was going to. Those are like, that's so hard. Um, yeah. And then the other is, is just like, uh, realizing at the end, like that no one cares about what you built <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. really something that seems like really exciting. And then you're like, yeah. here you go world. And then like crickets, like no one is using it and, and it doesn't feel like it felt like everyone wanted it, but then nobody seems to care once it's out like that's fair that's like very disappointing and sad that's happened to me that's a hard too. one and and that kind of gets to you know your your opinion although interesting is irrelevant right it's like we <laughs> might internally have re like a really strong feelings about it oh this product's awesome it's going to do all these great things and then we get it out into the market we launch it we release it and customers are just like meh <laughs> yeah eh. i guess that's, that's cool <laughs> sure yeah. if you think it's cool it must be i suppose but yeah it's yeah. it's really that you know inside out approach versus being outside in i think too a lot of times and getting that mm -hmm. you know the evidence from the customer and building what actually the customer wants versus like building things that we think are really cool that when they get out there they flop i, I that's that's such a i think that's a really good one i like that a lot <laughs> I think I feel like people can relate to that as well because I'm sure every product manager listening to this has had a situation, um, you know, where they've launched a product and that's been the case. Absolutely, totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's unfortunately a universal experience, practically. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, love that. Shifting gears a little bit just to innovation and thinking about, you know, how we how we stay, you know, in the context of even building things, I think that customers love um, and and just continuing to iterate and drive that innovation. 
first of all, Salesforce, how, like what, how are you uh, helping to drive that innovation at Salesforce? How is Salesforce pursuing innovation? And what do you think is important for driving innovation? What do you need? What are some of those things that help to do that? Fundamentally, an understanding of the jobs your customers are trying to do, like number one, like that's really like, I mean, super basic, but um, but that is going to help that informs everything else. And so it's so crucial. If you don't have that part right, you're not going to get any, you're not going to get the answer right, even if you have anything else. And then to understanding like um, where, like where technology is going and then being able to apply that to the jobs the customer is, is really trying to get, to get done um, are going to be the most crucial things. Um, and, and some, on some level, it's like, uh, what is like, you can baby step some level of innovation if it doesn't in, in, involve like technological advances. So like at a job a long time ago, we, we were making a, we we're trying to sort of incrementally improve the process of some folks that were working in an application mm. to do, um, to do like credit card processing for like small dollar, like product renewals. And we, at first it was like, Hey, can you just make it easier for them to do, to input the data into these like fields in this application? And then it was like, well, we, you know, we could, we could actually like, if we gave them a different kind of a different application and just, we put the stuff in there, we don't have to mess. We can make it a lot easier for them to communicate with the customer. But then it was like, Hey, you know, why do we even, why do they even need to communicate with the customer? They're like manually inputting all this data. Just why aren't we just like giving them a, a, like a payment gateway and having the customer do it themselves. And then they can just email mm -hmm. the customer and then like, well, wait a minute, why don't we just automatically send the email to, why do we have a person doing this at all? Like we can just automate these responses and have them do the payment gateway. So if you could take little steps like that towards innovation, or there's also just um, like tying the technological leaps to the things your customers, the jobs your customers are doing. So something like, mm. like generative AI is like such a huge, huge game changer for the way our customers are going to be able to create more personalized experiences to be able to like help their customers, like get the help they need to help, uh, to help like improve the relationship with, um, with their customers. So it, that is seeing that technology and then saying like, oh my gosh, our customers are doing so many things right now that this will help them with. Mm -hmm. How do we get this into our products ASAP so that they can use them in a way that really helps them speed up their own innovation and their own journeys with like this technology that's really revolutionizing. Like it's such a great point about AI. I'm definitely in, in the same camp as you. I, I just, and I think everyone else, it's just incredible to see how the rapid pace of change, I think that like LLMs and GPT and these AI m models are bringing to the industry. I think every day there's 50, like 60 new tools, plugins, you know, chatbots, anything that you like things that you can use to actually drive value for your business and, and, and improve the experience with your application. I think that's incredible. Um, you know, even to stay on another buzzword of disruption, I think it's, it's, yeah. it's hugely disruptive, but like in, in a really yes. good way. Right. I think it's, uh, yeah. I think it's awesome. But, um, thinking about like being a disruptor, what do you think that like, what do you think about the importance of being a disruptor? Do you think it's like more important for a large company to be disruptive or a smaller company to, to drive that disruption, to drive uh, more, uh, disruption? I think any type of company can be a disruptor. Um, and I think each, I think different company sizes have their own advantages to being able to do that. Like a, a larger company um, ha may have more easy access to be able to like, hey, we're going to stop doing this project over here because we're going to devote a lot of resources to doing, to working on kind of like disrupting this industry in a major way and making things like really significant and revolutionary. So that's like, that's sort of the tech that Salesforce takes. That's also like something like, like Apple and like the iPhone. I mean, that's like a big company doing something super disruptive. Mm -hmm. And then smaller companies just have the, have the advantage of being able to be super nimble and being able to be a disruptor in the industry with the one thing that they're doing. If you look at, you know, like Uber uh, or Lyft, like coming out with the concept of um, kind of like disrupting the, uh, the transportation industry, the taxi industry, and the shared the shared ride services industry, mm -hmm. um, coming in as like a starting it from 
as a smaller company, but doing it with that is their purpose. Their one, their one sole purpose is, is, is a, is a disruption to, to an existing industry. And so it's really, it can come from anywhere. Um, and there's just pros and cons and different ways that they're going to, that a company is going to, to be a disruptor, uh, depending on their size and resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was thinking a little bit around, obviously your direct your experience currently around the data and the privacy end of it as well, and thinking about innovation and disruption. And there was a really great podcast that you were on recently that kind of talked about the future of data versus privacy. And one of the things that stuck with me, I think from that talk that you gave is just the future of, of digital identities and why privacy why, why you felt that like privacy uh, and data, uh, you know, residency are really in the midst of a security renaissance. Could you talk a little bit more about that? You know, some, some thoughts around that. You really, sh I guess, shouldn't is the word I should use, have data without, without privacy. It's just like they, it has to go hand mm -hmm. in hand. And I think, um, and I feel like, although not every state, every country is going to make, do it exactly in the most efficient way. I think it's really exciting to see privacy regulations um, becoming more and more prevalent and more and more dominant in in the way in in the way that it's shaping how we're handling data because it's one of those things that like it can add overhead it does add overhead to make sure you're doing absolutely everything you can to keep customer data consumer data com private and secure and mm -hmm. that you are putting their interests um, and their protection first and it's one of those things where like it, it's it, instead of it becoming a trade off where a company's like, well, we could make this thing or we could like do this extra privacy feature. Um, the privacy feature is not always going to win out. But if there's a sort of a mandate around it, like this is the way that we all have to behave. Everybody's on the same playing field. And I'm seeing corporations really relish it for that reason. They're like, we want to do this. This is how we want to behave. This is how we want we want to be really good at this. Um, we're all consumers too. Everybody in these companies is also a consumer <laughs> for all the other companies. Like it's something that we we all want our data protected. And so um, be, having that, having a mandate around it and saying like, hey, this is the way that the game's gonna be played here. Like everybody has to do these things is um, I think makes it, easier for for everybody to do the things that honestly i think people want to do within these organizations in the first place yeah it's such a good point too like for any of the the marketing folks that are listening to the to this episode specifically you know when we think about privacy and security of customer data it's not that customers don't want personalization right but they need to know how uh, first of all we have to we need their consent to use that data first that their personal data and they need to know how it's going to be used, right? Like in such a way that it's going to make my experience with an application or interaction with that brand better. That's that's an okay outcome. There's value in that, but that's gotta be the focus. It, is, it needs to be consent forward and there needs to be a value exchange, I think, between you know the company uh, and the security of that data and the and the customer at the end of the day, uh, and that's that's really what it comes down to is because you myself or everyone we're all consumers at the end of the day too, and we want to be able to find out about in, about new products and new solutions and how they're going to make my life better, but it needs to be done in a consent forward way, and that's something I think that really resonated from that talk that you gave um, as well around your experience with data and privacy too. Even thinking just personally, when you think about the companies that you engage with regularly and that you have a close relationship with are going to be companies that you are sharing the most information you have. And you want, and you want though, and you do want those like personalized experiences. Like I want, uh, like I, uh, I would happily give more information to like the airline company. I have the most loyalty points with, um, to know when I've got, there's like a, where I've, there's a specific offer for a specific time. They always know I go on a, on a family trip, uh, in a, in a, in February during a specific time where like in between these two things that happen at work, it's the only time we get to go. And like, if they're like, Hey, we know that we're sending, we're going to send you, uh, like a deal, especially for that, that time period for, for this place. Like I would be like, yes, awesome. Um, but if some company I'd never heard of, uh, suddenly had my phone number and is reaching out to me, I would be like, how are you getting this information? This is super creepy. Like, don't yeah. talk to me, please. Um, and it would also damage my experience with a brand that I knew did have that information. So I think like using data in a consented way and treating it very carefully means you're going to have a really, really great relationship with your consumers and you're going to do, they're going to, they are going to continue to invest 
in you via their business and their data um, when you're treating their when you're treating the data the way they've asked you to treat it. Yeah, you, you made me think about an example uh, and kind of getting and linking it back to earlier when we were talking a little around the invisible hand and, and how amazing a customer experience is and so amazing that you don't even really understand or realize what's happening. If you think about how maybe 20 years ago, you know, how difficult it would have been to order a coffee, specifically like, you know, the coffee that you want to order to a location so you can go and pick it up because you happen to be driving by. I was kind of thinking about this the other day as that exact case happened to me where on my mobile app, because I'm signed into my profile and I'm already authenticated and they, they have information on me, you know, they knew my previous order. All I did was hit, you know, like order over order that same thing at this location. And then I showed up and Hey, mobile order from Matt is ready. And I just walk out of there. I just think about how like easy that experience was where 20 years ago, I would have had to call that location. Maybe they pick up the phone. Maybe they don't. They're busy. They forget my order. I have to tell them what I want because they don't know who I am. They have no information about me. So, you know, it's just, it's interesting to see how that convenience, like also paired with the, the data that the consented data that I have given that company to use about me and my profile uh, and just how amazing it, it has made that experience, but almost so amazing that it's seamless, that it's just, you don't even totally. notice it now. It's just, it's incredible. Oh. Totally. I like I buy like 90% of my home furnishings and decor from a single company now because it was the like I know it's super easy. Like I'm like, oh, that's that's fun. I like that. And it's and if it, like and I push a button and it know and it's like, cool, we know exactly who you are and it's on its way and it makes it like. It, it's, it's seamless and I'll do, and I'll, it, on the off times, I'll be like, oh, I really need X or something. I need, um, a very special type of chair. I don't know. And <laughs> I'll go to some other, I'll just like Google it and then find some other thing. And then I'll try to order, I'll try to order from some other or company. And it's like such a pain. Like half the time I don't even get through the checkout process. I'm like, all right, forget it. Like I'm not, I'm never doing this again. We're just going back to the one where I can push the button. So it's like, um, it, it's, tr it really is a game changer in terms of being in terms of customer loyalty and having repeat business and having a customer who is really like going to continue to spend money with you. I'm basically like half my paycheck goes to one furniture company. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone listening, Marla has a lot of special chairs, uh, in That's her right. office and in her house. <laughs> <laughs> from one company in particular. That's true. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, thinking about some of the things that you're working on this year, what are you most excited about, even just at Salesforce and, uh, you know, obviously whatever you can disclose, uh, but what, what are you most excited about uh, that you're, you're kind of working on this year? It's generative AI is the mm. thing that I think, I feel like we're really excited about. We are, there are, there's a couple of aspects to it. One, we have capabilities already that are just like tailor-made to go with generative AI, mm. like, we have, um, there's a product um, that we have uh, called Data Detect that basically will allow you to find data um, in fields and objects uh, in your database that don't, that are anomalous, that, mm. that we've just, that we don't think should belong there. So think of like somebody putting a credit card into a notes field or an email address into, into like a comments field or something, um, or data that you're going to potentially use uh uh, so data you're going to potentially use either in training a model or putting it into a prompt, and you're going to do that in an automated way. Um, like we're really excited about the idea that you can make sure that data is exactly the data you think it is and not accidentally send somebody's PII or send your personal information out into the, uh, out into the wide world of, uh, of generative AI. Mm -hmm. And so um, so that's one that that's one element, and then the actual introduction of um, generative AI itself in into all of our capabilities. And Salesforce mm. is doing some really cool things in um, both in the in the sales and service cloud space already. They just and they just uh, we just launched um, generative AI capabilities into Marketing Cloud and Commerce Cloud as well, which are super cool. Just the Marketing Cloud one's really neat, especially because it's just like. It goes to what we were talking about with um, with personalization and getting to know um, your customers better is like creating these really, really super personalized experiences. But of course, you have to have the consumer. You have to have a base on a consumer data to be able to do it, and you have to have trust with that consumer. And um, and typically, that is going to mean 
um, in the best cases, authenticated experiences with those consumers. Love it. That's awesome. And I feel like I already know the answer to this question based on how you answered a couple previous, but what, what's the number one tech development that you're most excited about or that you're most looking <laughs> forward to? Yeah, I think I pro yeah. Two letters, so AI. probably yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, we're mo just, we're super excited, about it, and we're also super excited to be at the forefront of privacy protection mm. around generative AI. I think it's really the combination of those things, like just like user experience and and privacy, user experience and security feel like they're a little at odds, but they're actually not. They actually go really well together. We feel the same way about um, pr yeah, privacy protections and AI. Uh, especially generative AI, that we that there is a way to do those together and to do them well, and we want to make sure that um, that that's something that we're that that we're sitting right on top of, uh, and that's something that we're we we care a lot about, and we're working deeply on it. Love it, yeah. I, I feel like we there's no way that we can get through an entire episode without talking about you know GPT models or you know LLMs or AI in some capacity. So I'm I'm happy that yeah. we've covered it uh, you know uh, uh, pretty deeply here today. And thanks for that. That's awesome. Um, Maybe, yeah, uh, just in the last couple of minutes, maybe getting into a couple of things, uh, you know, just a little about you and even just some advice for product managers. What do you think are some underrated or, or um, yeah, really underrated product management skills? The teams that I've that where we've gotten the most done and we've been able to really like build cool things together are the ones where we're kind of genuinely friends, like we're mm. like where every where you really are get you get along with everyone and you really trust everyone. So I think like from an underrated perspective, I would say like like it's really the ability to like genuinely get along with people and like them or find a way to like them if you're in a situation where maybe you don't inherently. Um and because it just makes everything easier. At the end of the day, like you can have tons of processes and um, agile methodologies and board, Kanban boards and whatever <laughs> the th things are that you're using, but it, they're all really supposed to just be tools to help you communicate your ideas and your thoughts back and forth and measure things and uh, measure progress, but measure them and uh, measure it in a way where you're like really getting what you're getting done is something that you're just communicating an idea about and then getting that idea sort of interpreted and built. And, um, and there's a whole bunch of people who have to work together to do that. And so the better you understand each other and the more trust you have and the more you're a, you really like can get along with those folks, I think is it, you're going to have the best outcome. So in terms of underrated, I'd probably say that like getting along, with, not being a jerk. <laughs> right. <laughs> it Super seems so underrated. easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> no, I, I do love that though. I think like the theme for me there uh, is, is like of collaboration and trust. Trust is probably the biggest one of, of what you kind of mm -hmm. said there. I think that's the key is, you know, if you, if you don't have trust, you're not going to be able to collaborate and you won't get anything done. It doesn't even matter if you're trying to build, you know, great, great products that customers love. It doesn't matter what it is you're trying to build. If you don't have that trust, I think with the team that you're working with, there's no way that you're going to be able to get, get that done. Uh, so that's, yeah. that's such a great point. A couple of quick hits as well. What's the, what's your favorite thing that you're either watching or reading right now? I mostly watch like garbage because <laughs> I just want to like zone out and turn my brain off. But um, reading, I just read, um, I just read a book called Unreasonable Hospitality. And it's like, it's this great intersection because it's like two things that I really like. One is like sort of like food stuff, like fancy food thing, like foodie things. I am not a foodie like I, at all. I actually have super simple taste. Like I could basically live just all like on potatoes. Um, <laughs> if I'm in yeah, hot sauce, like that's really... I'd be fine. Awesome. Um, but I like watching and, and hearing and looking and understanding like chef's table type, like just absolutely delight people mm. and delight your guests and your customers and your consumers with like the experience that you're providing, which is super, super relevant. And just a, it was such a great takeaway. Like it is not, it's not that hard. It's not that unreasonable actually to, to like make people really feel special mm -hmm. and good and important and like you value them like we do it's and um and that is just so so critical not just for your consumers really in your whole life uh, you can take take that lesson away but it was like a really great confluence of those things it was a cool book i love that i'll have to check that one out what's one place you would want to travel to um that uh that you're just dying to go to 
Oh man, I think if I was gonna live anywhere, oh man, I don't. It might. It'd probably be two places. One like Costa Rica, mm. which I like it. Just like the whole sort of philosophy of like Puerto Vida and like just ch everybody's like, hey, it's fine. Everything's gonna be fine. Just chill out. Is like one a little bit counter to my normal state of being and my personality. So I feel like. I, it's a, it's like a, it feels like a play. It just feels like it is the, is a very cool, very, very cool place. Um, and I could totally live there. That would be, that would be amazing. Um, or like on sort of the complete, um, well not complete other side, but like, um, I have always want, and I've actually always wanted to visit here too. So I guess this is answering both questions is, um, Nazare in Portugal. Mm -hmm. I didn't, so there is like this documentary, Oh my gosh, what's it? It's called like the hundred foot wave, I think, or the, yes. it's about a really I've big wave. I've seen this. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. It, it was like, not the documentary is amazing. So good. And like, so, so, so interesting. But that, but Nazare is where the wave is. And it just, the whole town was seemed like just an incredible place. Yeah. And so that's a place I would really, really love to visit and maybe live. I don't know. I've never been there, but <laughs> we'll at least definitely visit. It just seemed awesome. Yeah, there's a ton of, I think, videos of that wave specifically. I think you can easily find it online. Uh, but thinking about how folks can find you online, what's the best way uh, for them? <laughs> what's the best way for them to find you online? Not riding a 100 nice. foot wave, I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue. I'm on LinkedIn uh, and then also uh, on Twitter. I think my handle is just my name. I think it's just Marla Hay. Um, you can find me both of those places. LinkedIn for more professional version. Uh, Twitter for less professional version. Awesome. Uh, marginally. Uh, nothing crazy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Mistaken Identity, a podcast brought to you by Okta. As the leading independent identity partner, we free everyone to safely use any technology, anywhere, on any device or app. Find us at Okta.com.